Brilliant. Thank you. And thanks for the invite. Um, it's a hard on Stacey, really, but I'll, uh, I'll try and do it. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Matt. Over to you. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. Um, okay, so... Oh, hold on a sec. Oh, same problem with Stacey. There we go. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to try and build on really what, what Stacey's outlined um, and try and give you some sort of practical examples, really, of kind of what we do at Teesside and um, how we try and develop girls footballers. So I, I suppose it, this slide take around about 10 years ago when I started to work in girls football and where you sort of got this challenge of taking um, girls through from under 10s, under 11s and try and give them the physical characteristics to hopefully perform a youth age group or hopefully finally in the in the England squad as kind of Beth's doing at the moment. And um, without a huge amount of research available to us at the time and, and we're, we're still limited now but um, so we, we kind of had this challenge and um, and I suppose this is just uh, accumulation of what we kind of learn on the way um, so first of all we, we kind of when I'm putting a physical development program together it's got to fit within the the core values of the club so the, the core values of the club are around kind of respect, humility, honesty, discipline, resilience, and togetherness. So we, we need to bear that in mind, first of all, and we, we're trying to coach the person first. Um, so, so that's fundamentally important to fit in with the, the values of the whole club. Um, and then from a physical point of view, we look at the young athlete next. And then finally, the kind of footballer at the end of that, that's kind of the icing on the cake, really. Um, so, so for us, what, what we want them to be able to do when they leave the RTC, um, at kind of 16 years of age, is kind of move well, um, which Stacey's talked a lot about fundamental movement skills, and I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail, but we'll be able to move well and to be able to be adaptable, so be able to do that in a variety of different environments. It's okay for us to be able to get them to move well in a gym, but if they can't do that on the pitch, um then that's no good um so we want them to be adaptable to different environments different timings and tempos um and that that's some of the basis of the stage uh, approach that that stacy stacy put up um that when we get into the level fives and level sixes they're very adaptable to to that um we also want them to understand that the training journey so we want them to to be part of that um and we want to educate them about about the training principles and what, what we're trying to do with, with them. So when they leave at 16, if they don't have a strength and conditioning set up or anyone to help them, then they're educated enough to be able to move that on themselves. Um, and really, I suppose we try to prepare them to for what they go into next um, and to go into an elite environment um, when they're a little bit older. Um, and, and most of all, I suppose we want them to enjoy the time with us as well. Um, they're, they're only kids at the end of the day and we want it to be fun and enjoyable um so they're the kind of principles that underpin what we're trying to do um and then in terms of the training goals and i, I use this model by uh, franco and pelizzeris um to kind of try and set an organized training well we're working back from performance so understanding what are the determinants of performance or in our case the physical determinants of performance for for women's and girls football uh, as best we can um and then using that to to inform the training goals um so when we look at the literature the high speed running ability or kind of aerobic anaerobic fitness is perhaps one of the most important um kind of training goals um because that can differentiate between levels of performance so we we know from some of um, Naomi Datsun's work um that that if we the, the players with the highest the best high speed running ability tend to be those that go on into international or professional setups. Um, so that's an important um, area for us in terms of um, performance. Um, equally sort of increasing that sprint speed or sprint capacity or sprinting ability, because uh, we know that's important on the pitch. Um, improving acceleration, but also deceleration um, and, and in turn kind of agility. So, so from a strength and conditioning perspective, if we're looking to improve agility, from, from my point of view, I want to try and improve their ability to accelerate and to decelerate, uh, and then their, their ability to move in space, uh, which links into my fundamental movement skills. Um, 
And then, of course, improving fundamental movement skills, strength and robustness. Um, so we, we can focus on high running ability, but if we don't, if we don't focus on fundamental movement skills and, and all the things that Stacey's just talked about, then we're probably going to end up with uh, injured players at the, the end of the journey. So, so we really need to focus on this to be able to earn the right to do some of the other stuff. Um, so so that, that's kind of how we set our training goals. And I'll try and go over them in a little bit more, more detail. And, and Stacey mentioned the model by Lloyd and Oliver in terms of how that fits into long-term athlete development. So again, fundamental mo movement skills are an essential building block. But when, when we look at the model by Lloyd and Oliver, at, at the early, early years, fundamental movement skills are highly emphasized. But I, I would argue we need to keep that going for longer, um, particularly as fundamental movement skills are not developed particularly well in, in schools at the moment. And children are leaving primary school without mastery of, of basic fundamental movement skills. So you can't assume that the girls have developed these skills well enough early. Um, and there's an argument throughout maturation that we need to keep sort of topping that up. Um, so the thing I would say alongside fundamental movement skills is we can develop strength with those fundamental movement skills as well. And that might be advantageous. And we've just got some work that we're, we're writing up at the moment that's shown in, um, in primary schools that if we combine strength training with fundamental movement skills, we might get get a better improvement in some physical qualities and fundamental movement skill it, itself. Um, and that could be very similar to Stacey's, what Stacey's doing, um, where, where we're working on uh, body weight exercises, um, body weight strength exercises. We're going to get some neural adaptations that should improve both strength and fundamental movement skill. Um, we want to work on speed and agility and dy dynamic movement skill. And I'll, I'll show you in a minute about trying to work in three planes of motion um, with our movement development. And, and strength and power, both concentric and eccentric, is important. And again, I, I just our work is very similar to what Stacey has presented um, in terms of if we start to develop the um, maybe the, the loads lifted potentially as um, as the athletes get a little bit older, uh, depending upon their, their competence. Um, in this model as well, we, we, we've got, there's a, there's a kind of a highlight of hypertrophies hyper highlighted at around the age of kind of 11, 12, 13. And I, I kind of question that. Um, it'd be interesting to get Stacey's thoughts on that. Um, but I'm not sure how much of a priority kind of developing muscle size is at those ages compared to strength, neural control, fundamental movement skills, etc. cetera. Um, and there's a de-emphasis here in endurance uh, and fitness capabilities, which again, I, I would question. And the rationale for that is that the assumption that um, players will get, get an improvement in, in endurance and Kind of aerobic anaerobic fitness from from training and what we've found over, over the years is that football training and at all matches doesn't really provide at, at, at our within our group um and that might not be transferable to other other sports and other groups but that they don't get the right stimulus to improve fitness unless we do some some extra extra work and it could be running based work ourselves um but i i would reiterate that that really needs to be done on top of a um a good fundamental movement skill competence. So fundamental movement skills, and we've talked about these a lot, but um, these basically allow children to explore the physical environment and through kind of efficient movement. Um, and, and they're not only linked to kind of the building box for more, more performance related training, but they're also very, they're also essential really for public health. Um, the, the ability to move helps us move more uh, and means into adulthood then, then the kids are more likely to, to be, be kind of physically active, which is obviously um, multiple kind of health benefits. So it's not just about performance, developing fundamental movement skills. Um, and, and one of the issues is that, that children don't really develop that particularly well at the moment within the PE curriculum. Um, so we need to look at different ways we can explore it. Um, an example on the picture is we every um, every so often we get the girls into the climbing wall, and we, we do try and do a number of multi sports with the with the girls in the earlier, uh, particularly in the in the earlier uh, age groups. But um, 
really throughout as well to give them exposure to different movements. And climbing is a great, great way of kind of developing certain multiple, certain movement skills um, and sort of challenging the, the girls in different ways. And that, that's kind of almost a treat strength and conditioning session for them. Uh, if they work hard through a block, then we, we tend to um, tend to get them on the climbing wall or uh, do some gymnastics or do something a little bit different. Um, so just building on and, and Stacey's already presented this, but um, and this is this is her data, but she's talked about the increase in body mass um, as as players mature um, and the decrease in the ability to produce force quickly. Um, and these are just just really graphing what what Stacey's shown. And, and what we do find is there's potentially an increase in injury risk as well, knee injury, knee ligament injury risk. When, when we we see this drop off in the ability to produce force quickly. So this is a key area of training we need to focus on. Um, and this is kind of what it looks like from a landing mechanics point of view. So pre-peak height velocity, uh, we tend to find landing can be reasonably good um, if we practice it. And with the younger age groups, we will spend quite a lot of time practicing landing, stabilizing. And um, sometimes as, as players grow, it can it can start to falter a little bit, particularly if they grow a lot, as this, this player had done. Um, so we just need to revisit that and potentially regress that a little bit. Um, and sometimes when, when players have grown quite aggressively, that, that can take a little bit of time. Um, you can see how much harder it is to, to control that movement. Um, so one of the key focuses uh for us in terms of training is kind of being able to put the brakes on um so so when we're working on this term of this idea of, of braking st strength and landing stabilization is really important the ability to just stop um you know accelerate and then stop it's quite important it's trunk stability and trunk control um eccentric strength so uh, a really simple uh, exercise is something like the nordic hamstring which can be done on the, on the pitch um just be very careful with the, the volume to start with if you haven't done that exercise before um but um you know we, we we use that quite a lot with our players um we'll work on dynamic balance and fundamental movement skill challenges and, and trying to get them to control those movements as i've shown you before um and this, if this works, I'll see if this, this works on here. This was just an example of a kind of deceleration drill. Other people can see that okay. Uh, quite a simple one. You don't need to bring in the resistance that these players have got, but being able to stop and land into these positions are quite good. So we will work on that. Um, quite a bit, th those kind of positions. And it, and it can start from just standing and dropping into a lunge position or being able to do a lunge. So I think Stacey had um, put in her presentation that, about being able to find a position first. So if we can find a lunge position, if we can hold that lunge position, and then we can start to challenge it from dropping into that position or accelerating and then stopping into that position. So that's kind of an example of how you can progress a, a fundamental movement into something that starts to look like something that's useful in terms of on the football pitch. Um, we work on sprint development as well. Um, and a couple of the key positions we might work on is this um, almost hip lock or a stand position. Again, there was a, a good example in Stacey's presentation of players working on this position within a warm up. Um, so can we hold that position? Can we get into that position and hold it? Uh, and that can be as simple as working on a lunge and moving into that position and holding. Um, we'll we'll work with the players on their ability to manipulate their their centre of mass and the base of support. I should say base of support. Um, and and the other other area is the interaction with the foot on the floor, and that's where uh, plyometric training might come in. Um, simple thing coaching can do, just such as skipping, will really help on help with that. Um, so working on the springs of the body, and that we use that for for sprinting. Um, so just focusing a little bit now on fitness development um, and and the need for it. Again, using a bit of Stacey's data and some of our own, 
we we find that over time that the there's, the girls do improve um, in terms of the fitness ability, but there's potentially a bit of a plateau with that. Um, and um, it could be that training rather than maturation is a key driver for this as well. Um, as so we we've found periods where we've where we've put in high intensity interval training, then we've got improvements in fitness. Um, but where they go through the season, it tends to plateau across. So the pre-season period tends to be the, the period that we get the improvements in um, in fitness. Uh, and we don't really get the stimulus throughout the season unless we add it in. And we, and we really need to find ways to improve that. If we look at boys' academy players, they're substantially higher than the girls. There's a, a big imbalance between the boys and the girls in terms of kind of football specific fitness um, and that's much more than you'd expect between males and females um, so it's an area we do need to probably look to develop and particularly given its importance on the pitch um, so we've done a little bit of work in that area um, and there, there probably is I think a need for some specific conditioning elements to your training um, some additional running based base work and that's not just getting people to mindlessly run around the pitch, but some some intervals, um, some work at, um, at different tempos of running could be really beneficial. And, and, but really in those players that have gone post peak height velocity, um, it's not something I would spend a huge amount of time concentrating on the younger players. Um, we, um, we tend to find as well that if we're going to get an improvement, we want our session ratings to be quite hard for breathlessness. We are, I'll, I'll show you in a minute how we, how we, uh, monitor training sessions but but we ask them to rate their breathlessness exertion and if that's around very hard for the session then we're probably going to get an adaptation um, but we do need to be cautious with young players um, in terms of this type of training and we're probably the time's probably better spell, spent elsewhere um, we also just need to be a little bit cautious if we're going to put um, changes of direction into that that training with players at peak height velocity uh, particularly if they're going through a growth spurt um, so in terms of how we, we monitor that, we just use, there's, there's a number of scales. We use the Borg CR100 scale, but there's, there's a CR10, which is a little bit simpler, which, which, which works fine. And we get players to rate where they are against these kind of verbal anchors and then relate that to a number. Um, and, and that, that's been shown. We've shown that that's quite, that's a valid measure of looking at intensity at, um, within girls footballers, these, these age groups, certainly at 14s and 16s. Um, and it's a really simple method that can be used as long as it's done well. Um, you do need to spend time talking players through it uh, and making sure we're, we're kind of challenging them and, and reiterating the process of going through this. Otherwise, they can just pick a number uh, and we want them to not to really look at the numbers, to look at the verbal anchors and see where they rate the session. And we ask them to do that overall in terms of breathlessness, legs and upper body. And we actually get some really useful information uh, from that, uh, particularly for conditioning sessions where we might look at the difference between breathlessness and legs. Um, so, um, so just, I also just wanted to, to talk about, about this in relation to bringing people back. So we've got our first training session tonight on the pitch um, since lockdown. Uh, and, I suppose some of the challenges are around around that. And we, what we've done over the, we've been doing sessions via Zoom and we've got a system where we're getting players to rate their, their soreness on a one to seven scale, the mood, the hydration and things like that. And that's actually been quite useful, particularly asking for some comments. And I think, I think the key thing here is knowing your players uh, and getting as much information off your players as possible, which will help you. Because we've got this situation now where um, we kind of know the fitness we know where P players are at in terms of fitness generally, but we, we've had this situation where they've been off for a long time and some people might have been doing an awful lot. Others um, might not be doing much at all. So we, we, we could have a real disparity between where the players are at and that, that that's uh, causes some problems for bringing them back into training safely. Um, so in terms of um, kind of advice for that is trying to, I suppose, look at the bottom level uh, and try and gradually increase things uh, and take things slowly. Um, we've always got normal, com we've got complications in youth sport um, in terms of understanding what the players do outside of uh, our sessions. 
um, and understanding the status of the players when they come in. And that's just been been further highlighted with the with the issues around around COVID and what what's been going on in lockdown. So um, so we just need to be aware of that. And what we want to try and do is get everyone to, you know, a, a kind of full tank really, so they're safe to go back into competition. Um, so the more information we can get from the players, um, the better in terms of being able to plan training. Um, and the, these are some of the issues that, for children throughout lockdown that I'm sure we're all, we're all kind of aware of, but just, just be mindful of that, really. So finally, in terms of how we, we're organising probably the next six weeks or so of training um, and how, how we're putting this all together, um, we, we have a, a technical theme for each week. Um, and then alongside that, there'll be some high-speed running capability work with the under-14s and under-16s. We'll probably do some repeated sprint games, relays, fun games with the with the younger age groups, um, and we'll graduate sprint efforts. So if players have not sprinted since um, I can't six months ago, nearly maybe um, since we went into lockdown, then we need to be very careful about getting them back into sprinting. So we'll develop that throughout the six week period. Um, we'll start with two weeks that will probably focus mainly on on breaking strength. We'll focus on acceleration and then finally into sprinting in larger areas. Um, but we'll, we'll always keep be mindful of that breaking strength, even when we're, we're moving into sprinting. We'll, we'll keep keep elements of this in. Um, in terms of strength and conditioning, at the moment, our um, gym-based sessions are all via Zoom, um, working with players in their own living rooms. So we, we're restricted with all age groups to kind of body weight. Um, but we'll focus on eccentric control, uh, landing stabilization initially. We'll have a couple of weeks where we'll start to build some more concentric work um, before kind of a focus around isometrics and plyometrics. Again, that's not everything we do in the sessions. That's just the focus. Um, and throughout, there'll always be some fundamental movement skills with strength, always be some general capacity, what we term in capacity. So calf work, hamstrings, trunk, uh, and hip disassociation. So the ability to disassociate lower and upper body um we found really important for um to being able to move on the pitch so we'll always keep some of that work in throughout um so finally to, to kind of recap the checklist for training for me is fundamental movement skills at all age groups um jump in landing plyometrics if if the players are, are capable of it um and that that could be as simple as skipping it doesn't have to be um we don't have to be doing depth jumps or anything too fancy, but something that's getting them to do some kind of plyometrics. Um, strength of hip, trunk, calf, hamstrings will, will be in there, particularly with the older players, post-peak height velocity. Um, not necessarily the younger players will we'll get strength through the fundamental movement skill training. Um, we'll always have some balance and proprioception work, um, acceleration and, and braking and maybe a little bit of change of direction. Rotational movements. Okay, again, we're working in three planes of motion, so we'll try and keep that in. Anaerobic and anaerobic fitness. So that's kind of our checklist for stuff that we should be including within a block of training. And finally, within all that, you can get a little bit serious and bogged down, but it's kind of youth sport, and we want to have fun. Um, and that's 